The next speaker that we have coming up, um, this man, he did 17 years total service uh, between active duty and reserves uh, for the Navy SEALs. And he also, like Jocko just mentioned there, it, not only did he serve under Task Unit Bruiser in Ramadi um, in 2006, which was definitely one of the toughest fights in Iraq, um, but he's also on staff now for Echelon Front, working directly under Jocko Willink. And with that, I'd love for you guys to help me welcome Mr. Andrew Paul. Unmuted. How are you guys doing here today? Y'all imagine in your homes and uh, sitting at your, in your houses, your home offices on your couch and following those stay at home orders. Um, I'm, I'm in my home office. You can see just around, around the edges of my, uh, my echelon front backdrop. You can see my phone and my jacket hiding there in the back and my air conditioner over there on the side, you know, so this is the new normal, right? And um, it's taken some ad adjusting for all of us, no matter what kind of business you're in. I know this is a legion of loan officers. It's, a, it's an audience that's it's still primarily with loan officers and potentially it sounds like uh, some real estate agents who are in here. Um, Nick, are we gonna have, um, is there any time for, uh, for Q&A here today at all? Is there, is there interactive pieces or is it just uh, kind of one direction? Yeah, we can definitely have Q&A. So as people have questions for you, if you wanna riff first and then I'll pay attention to the comments and I can drop in any questions as people ask them. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so um, you know, look, guys, this is this is the new normal, when and it, and, it, and hopefully it's not going to be normal forever. But but the only thing that I, I I can tell you that is constant is change. And and if you've been in the in the mortgage business long enough, you've seen these changes happen time and time again. I mean, I can't do the show hands thing here, or whatever. But how many people have been you know in the business you know more than five years, you know more than ten years, more than fifteen years, and and some of you certainly um, you know watching right now have have been around to see. Um, you know, uh, the last recession that we had, you know, uh, we call it the great recession for those of us who, who lived through that, uh, you know, and small kind of hat tip to the great depression, but certainly not as bad as the great depression. And we don't ever want to even want to take away from that, but certainly the recession of 08, 09 was, was pretty rough. And, um, just so you know, I also have a, you know, here I am the leadership instructor and chief of staff for Echelon Front. Um, Jocko Willink was my task unit commander in the Battle of Ramadi. I served uh, several tours to Iraq, um, and you know my time in the SEAL teams was um, was incredibly rewarding. It was a job that I'd always wanted to do my whole life. I, I got to actually go overseas and see the kind of combat that I always hoped to. But most importantly, through those experiences overseas, working with you know elite forces, uh, not just in the Navy but across all branches, the Army, the Marine Corps, and the Air Force, um, we really began to see kind of what kinds of character traits, either in individuals and among teams, especially, and certainly in leadership that creates winning teams, what are those common core values, those processes, those systems, those ways of leading that are, that are similar among the best teams and the best leaders that we've ever worked with or worked for. And it was really out of the experience in the Battle of Ramadi, um, where Jack, Jocker was my task unit commander and, and Leif Babman, who's a co-author of the book, Extreme Ownership, and the co-founder of Echelon Front. Um, after that deployment, Leif and Jocko got, got together, wrote this book, and, and created the company that was, that was uh, now a leadership company that's focused on helping teams and companies take ground in their battlefield, whatever type of business that is, and learn from the lessons that we learn and that other teams have learned um, in business and in, and in combat. And so that's kind of the whole premise between you know, Echelon Front and, and the leadership lessons that, that we've learned um, in, in combat and in business and codified into the book Extreme Ownership. Now, Normally, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I would have been out there in Las Vegas with you guys, and uh, we would have had an in-person uh, sort of keynote presentation where I've gone a little bit deeper into some of the laws of combat. And obviously, all that stuff has changed now. And, you know, we are working with lots of companies right now. We, so just to, you know, things change. I started to say that the only thing constant is change. And, and where I started to go with all that was that, you know, the mortgage business, if you were in the mortgage business in, in 07, 08, 09, you saw nothing but change. And just so you know, that's when I got into the mortgage business. I got off active duty in 2007 and I went right into the mortgage business. And I did loans. I've been doing loans ever since then. And it was just a little over a year ago that I actually joined Echelon Front as a leadership instructor and the chief of staff. So for those of you guys who are sitting there, um, you know, wonder what's Andrew Paul doing here? Well, now I, I, I work as a leadership instructor teaching these, what we call our laws of combat. Um, which you can read more about in the book, Extreme Ownership, which I highly recommend that you pick up. I mean, that should basically be um, like a battlefield manual for how you can take ground and win like right now. Um, but 
the cornerstone of the leadership principles that we teach are the four laws of combat. And those laws of combat are cover and move, simple, decentralized command, and prioritize and execute. And I'll go in more detail into those and some hands-on examples and a keynote presentation, um, which unfortunately we didn't get to do uh, in Las Vegas. It's a lot more fun in person, but we're adapting. Nick's doing a great job here with Legion of Loan Officers, bringing you guys all together um, in a virtual online platform. That's what we've got to do. And, and so by the way, guess what Echelon Front has done? We, we've had to do the same thing. We've had to adapt and we've had to change the, our ability to reach our customers. You know, for a long time at Echelon Front, I'm gonna share sort of an inside, you know, kind of behind the, the scenes look. You know, what we did was keynotes, uh, presentations and, and workshops for leaders at, at all kinds of different companies. We thought, well, that's what we do. That's what, and, and that's what we did. And, and through this change, you know, just so you know, you know, Legion of Loan Officers that, that I was gonna come present at was, was one of, of more than 40 events that were canceled or postponed. Um, some were canceled, never to come back. Some were postponed and some we're not sure yet because people don't know what they're gonna do. Um, we had to shift, we had to kind of ask ourselves, what is it that we really do here? And, and, and what's our mission? Our, our, we feel like our, our mission, what we do here is, is, is impact people and leaders so that they can lead their teams, lead their companies, lead their families to the next level of success and lead them through the challenges that inevitably all businesses, all families, all teams face. Now, again, this is mostly a mortgage crowd, but we, know we work with companies in oil and gas and manufacturing and biotech, every business that you could imagine. Um, and leadership challenges are fundamentally the same. The reason why they're fundamentally the same is because we have people in our organizations and people have been fundamentally the same for 5,000 years. And so this, this leadership is, is the consistent thing that separates winning teams from losing teams. Um, certainly there can be some luck, there can be some timing, um, but right now in this changing market, it's changing for everybody. And the teams that can adapt quickly to this changing environment find the new opportunities are the ones who are going to come out ahead. There are going to be some companies that don't, that, that die and they never come back. There are going to be some that decline. They're going to slow down. Um, and then as they come out the other side, they'll, they'll come back, you know, you know, and, and, and be functioning. But there are some companies who are going to thrive right now. And, 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 and some of the, the way that some of those companies are going to do that is they're going to adapt. And one of the ways you can do that is obviously through electronic platform, like what we're doing today here. Now, Anytime there's change involved, there's always resistance. People who are naturally going to be reluctant to that change. Why? First of all, that's not the way we've always done it. They're, they, pe people are fundamentally creatures of habit, and so they want to do things kind of like the way they've always done them. And so some people on your teams are going to have a hard time adapting just because they're very comfortable in their current routine. And so what you have to do is you have to show up as a leader and you have to lead them through those challenges. You have to lead them through to see what the opportunity looks like if they adapt to those changes. You can't just come in and say things like, hey, we are gonna do this now, and, and because I said so. As leaders, one of the best things that we can do for our teams is to explain the why behind what we're doing. When people understand the why, they can actually get behind the reason. When you just tell them what to do, you've got some good soldiers who will just do what you're asking them to do because they believe you and they trust you. And, 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 and that's because you built relationships with them. But also you've got people who, who, won't just, who won't do that. You have some people who are just naturally, either you don't have that kind of trust or relationship or they're just not wired that way. And so what you have to do as a leader is you're gonna to have to spend time with the people on your team explaining to them why the new way of doing things is what's gonna to lead to success down the road. The hard part sometimes for us as leaders is that taking the time to explain the why feels like a step back. You as a leader may have this vision. You may, you may see that this is going to be the solution and you may be right. But if other people can't see that yet, it's going to be hard for them to get on board. And again, you're going to have different camps of folks. Some folks are going to get on board and just follow along because either they trust you or they're just good at doing what's, what you ask them to do. But you're going to also have a bunch of people who aren't going to get on right away. And that can be frustrating, but you've got to really see that your job as, as a leader is to educate and explain to your team the reason why you need to change and adapt to a certain thing. Um, and when you go to explain the why, just because you explain the why, don't expect that people are just gonna naturally go, oh, okay, no problem. They may still not see it. 
they may not agree with it. Um, there may be times they don't, they don't see it yet and, and you might get frustrated. And this is where one of the core tenets of, i.e. the title of the book, which is called Extreme Ownership, comes into play. A lot of times when we um, work with leaders and, and, and we, they have challenges and situations where people on their team aren't doing what they're asking them to do, we have to ask the question of the leader and say, well, why, why are the people on your team doing what you're asking them to do? And, um, you know, well, you know, I don't, I don't know. Well, I mean, this would show up, this would show up in the SEAL teams all the time too, like new junior officers who are leading a platoon through training or something like that. We would, you know, we'd go out when they do a, a, an exercise that's, you know, meant to challenge them, meant to throw the team off. We put them in different situations so we can get the leaders to make phone, make calls um, under pressure. And so we can see how the team executes when faced with different challenges. And, you know, the whole thing is a disaster. And we're doing a debrief afterwards and we'll go say to the leader, like, well, why isn't the team performing or why did you guys fail that evolution or why didn't you guys execute on time or why weren't you on target on time or something like that and you can take an example of that for your business like why didn't the loan close on time why didn't i you know why weren't the documents there where they needed to be why did i not foresee this underwriting condition why is it just popping up that the guy's divorced and he owes child support and alimony why why did why is it coming up three days before closing instead of at the beginning why well you know People will say, you know, sometimes, you know, leaders go, what? well, I don't know, you know, they're just not doing what they're supposed to do. We, you know, we, you know, kind of challenge that young, young junior officer and, and, and say, well, well, why do you think that people, your people aren't doing what you're asking them to do? Well, I don't know. Well, is it because are they, they're not listening to you? Well, yeah, they're not listening to me. Well, why aren't they listening to you? They, they, don't, they don't trust you or what? They don't respect you? Well, no. Okay. Well, are they deaf? No, they're not deaf. Okay, are, are your people stupid? Maybe they just don't, they're stupid. Maybe they just don't understand. Um, well, actually, I kind of just gave it away there. Well, no, they're not stupid. What's the answer? The answer is, is that they don't understand. And the reason why they don't understand is why? Why don't your people understand? Who, whose fault is it that your people don't understand why they need to do the task that you're asking them to do? Whose fault is that? Well, it's your fault. It's your fault as a leader. And that's the big bottom line takeaway with extreme ownership. If you're a leader and your people aren't doing what you want them to do, they're not doing what you're asking them to do, whose fault is it? It's your fault. And right now more than ever, we have to spend time with our people and we have to explain the why behind the new changes. Maybe it's new changes to loan guidelines. Maybe it's new changes to a process in the, in the loan. Maybe it's a new form that they need to fill out. Maybe there's a new policy. Well, why? We have to explain the why to our people for a number of reasons. If we don't explain the why to them, they just, they, they can't possibly get on board. If people don't understand the why, they, there's no way that they can execute the plan effectively. But let me explain to you the why behind why you need to explain the why. If no other reason, then so that if there's a new policy that you need your loan officers to follow and they don't understand it, how can they possibly explain it to their borrowers? Well, I don't know why we need this. This is stupid, right? I mean, if, if your people understand, if you, if you have loan officers that work for you um, and, and there's a new policy of why you need a certain form or document, you say, hey, we need this form. And everyone's like, well, that's stupid. Why do we need that now? It's a, Ugh, you know? Well, let me explain to you why we need that form. Here's what happens. When you help your loan officers, or maybe it's even yourself, because we're gonna get into another aspect of extreme ownership here, when you explain the why and help your people understand that, that allows them to turn around and have an effective conversation, for example, with their borrowers, with their clients. Hey, I'm really sorry to throw this at you, but this new policy just came out. We need this new form filled out as a result of all the furloughs and the layoffs and the forbearances and whatever else is going on. And, um, and it's not that we don't trust you. It's just that we need to make sure that we're doing a loan for somebody that can actually repay it. And, um, there's widespread fraud that's going on. And I know that you're not doing that, but it's one of those you know, widespread type of things that's happening right now in our current environment. I'm sorry to inconvenience you last minute, but that's ultimately why we need the form. Um, if you don't mind filling out, I'd really appreciate it. So it gives your people the, the ammunition that they need to explain to their borrowers. Now, likewise, if you're a loan officer and somebody is telling you that there's a new process and there's a new policy and it just doesn't make any sense and it sounds like a bunch of BS to you, well, whose fault is that? The answer is it's your fault. Um, in the concept of extreme ownership, everything is your fault. 
everything is your responsibility as well. You own everything, all of the problems and all of the solutions. And so I want you to, guys to start thinking about everything that you're facing right now as you're the ones who are going to own everything. And the moment that you start blaming anyone or anything or any circumstance is the moment that you start to fail actually at extreme ownership. So you're in the loan business and there's a new policy that comes out. Maybe it's a new lock policy. Maybe it's a new underwriting guideline because of everything that's going on with forbearances and things like that and furloughs or whatever. And you're like, well, this is ridiculous. This is BS. Now in an ideal world, your boss would explain the why behind the new policy. But not everybody does that. Not everybody are great communicators. So you have the opportunity to take extreme ownership here. And the way you do that is if you don't know, and you're like, well, I don't get this. This doesn't make sense. How am I supposed to explain this to my borrowers? How am I supposed to explain this to the loan officers who work for me on my team? How am I supposed to explain this to my processor? It's not my fault. It's not my policy. Well, I'm failing at extreme ownership right now. The way I take extreme ownership is I say, hey, boss, you got a minute see this new policy coming out and I just don't understand it. So you need to lead up the chain of command and take ownership up the chain of command. Say, hey boss, can you explain some of this behind it? Now you may not agree with the reason. That happens. But when you understand the why behind it and you can ask questions respectfully, it gives you the ammunition to then turn around and be a better leader for your loan officers, for your borrowers or everybody else in your chain of command or within your organization who work with or for you. So if somebody's not giving you the why, you, know, you can blame the boss up the chain of command and go, oh, this is BS. They don't understand what it's like down here in the trenches. You know, they're not dealing with loan officers and people who want to float their rates down now that the rates are better than when I locked it three weeks ago. I mean, you can blame up the chain of command or you can take ownership and lead up the chain of command and ask those questions yourself so that you can better explain them to the people who are on your team. Okay, so can you take ownership of everything? Yes, you sure can. Everything? Okay, I start getting pushback. Now, this is a very one-way conversation because I'm just doing this over live to you guys. Everything? Oh, okay. What's the, what, I'll, oh, people immediately start, well, if I, okay, what, what's something that you could maybe, maybe you could skate out of and say, oh, well, I can't take ownership of this. What can you not take ownership of? What could you maybe not take ownership of? I mean, this is a trap because, you know, I represent the guy who wrote the book, Extreme Ownership. So there is nothing. Um, oh, the weather, people go, oh, I can't control the weather. You know, do you think in the military and the SEAL teams that like, you know, we, we controlled the weather? No, we didn't. We didn't control the weather. So we got to go do a mission or an operation. And the weather, for example, might impact our ability to execute that operation. Can I control the weather? No, I cannot control the weather. But what can I control and what can I take ownership of? I can take ownership of putting together contingency plans. I can get, I can take ownership of contingencies and alternate ways of executing something or putting safeguards or risk mitigation policies in place so that if the weather comes in a certain way, there's another way to execute the mission or contingency plan to still solve the mission that was given to me. Can you control the market? No, you can't control the market, but what can you do? You can control how you explain market conditions to your borrowers and to your clients. You can control when you lock your loan, can't you? So you can explain the value to somebody about locking in a savings today, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, or make sure that you're having conversations up front so that you help them take ownership of the decision to lock or float. Um, and so you can take ownership of the way in which you communicate and educate your, your clients and your teammates. So no, you can't control the market, but you can certainly own the conversation and the expectations that go along with what's happening in today's current market. And that's about as about the best that you can do now. Um, so anyway, that's just a piece on, on ownership and extreme ownership. Um, working with uh, several companies right now who I've done workshops and keynotes, keynote workshops for in the past and, and half day and full day workshops where we've uh, dived deep into the concept of extreme ownership. Um, with some hands-on practical applications. And, and you'll get more of this, by the way, because we're rescheduled. I believe it's for November, Nick. Um, and um, we're going to get into more detail on, um, you know, our four laws of combat and our mindsets for victory and to go into more detail on these things. Um, but right now, what I'm seeing um, very common right now um, 
across the board with leaders and companies that I'm currently working with in a virtual kind of capacity is people are fearful right now. People are fearful and they're worried. And that's a very natural thing to be experiencing right now. There's a lot of uncertainty. And as leaders right now, one of the last kind of pieces of powerful tidbits that I can give you is, is that as a leader, people look to you for how they should respond versus react in situations like that, like this. You're the one who sets the tone. If you freak out, if you lose your mind, you actually give permission for everybody else around you to lose their minds and freak out. How you talk to people, how you respond to people in stressful situations gives those people permission and how to act and respond to other people on your team as well. Are things stressful right now? Yes, for a number of different reasons. In the mortgage business, I've talked to folks at four or five different mortgage companies or mortgage situations, whether they're brokers or bankers or correspondents or retail, like big bank bankers, and everybody's got problems. They're slightly different, but they all got problems. The difference is how you choose to see the opportunity through that problem. Rally your team to get through this. Right now, one of the mortgage companies that I'm working with is actually handling this current market and situation better than like the five other companies that I'm talking to. Like minimal overlays, their rates are amazing, their turn times are still 48 hours. They are so, but they are so busy right now. They have more loans that they can possibly deal with. Their problem is they are stretched not to the capacity, beyond capacity, the bleeding edge of their sanity right now. And everybody is on edge. They are overworked. They're tired. They've got more business than they've ever had. And so in a moment like this, the leadership, the way that I've showed up for these folks and helped them it raise their level of leadership among themselves and among their teams is to see, um, is, 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 is to have some perspective. Perspective is very powerful. And here's this perspective that I shared with them. With them, they've got more business than they've ever had. There are companies out there right now that have shut their doors and will never reopen. Never. People who have built their businesses for years, 10, 15, 20 years, They've shut their doors and they will never reopen. They've watched their lifelong labor of love up in smoke, gone through no fault of their own. They've worked hard. They've marketed. They've served their customers. They've done all of those right things. And a, literally a virus comes along and has roiled the entire world. And these guys have got more business than they've ever had in their lives. Some people would love to have their set of problems. I'm going to tell you right now, there are some people, there are people out there that whatever problems you have right now, some people out there right now would love to have your set of problems. They love to trade places with you. Now that doesn't make whatever you're dealing with and working through right now any easier. It doesn't make your problem go away, but how you see the problem, how you choose to approach it, your mindset and your perspective, that absolutely is a key ingredient of how the winningest teams and the best leaders and the best organizations that I've ever been a part of, including the SEAL teams, the best companies that I've ever worked with or worked for, how they've exceeded and excelled beyond their competition. It's their perspective. So again, it doesn't take the problem go away, but having some perspective, these folks have got more business than they, than they ever know. Now they're, now they're overworked, they're tired, they're, they're exhausted, they're kind of getting on each other's nerves. And so I'll close with this last point. The first law of combat in the book, Extreme Ownership, is called Cover and Move. And Cover and Move, as you'll find out more if you join us in an um, in-person event in Las Vegas, fundamentally, Cover and Move is a gunfighting tactic. One gunfighter provides cover by laying down lead and fire while the other moves and maneuvers on the enemy. And then he lays down fire in a position while the other guy leapfrogs and moves to another location. And they leapfrog so forth, providing cover and moving, cover and moving. Okay. This is basically, it's a gunfighting tactic. And it's fundamentally basically the only actual military infantry tactic that exists is cover and move. And what happens is, is that we've seen how that applies to the business world because it is fundamentally the mo at, at its core, the purest example of teamwork that I could, that I could really ever think of. 
So cover and move, although uh, is fundamentally a military gunfighting tactic, is essentially is teamwork. And right now, more than ever, this company that I was just describing to you, who's tired but has more business than they've ever had and is otherwise weathering the storm incredibly, more than ever, they need to focus on their team and on their teamwork and on their relationships. Because no matter what, when they come through this, and this cycle of nutso ness insanity ends, and it will end, this because this too will change. This, this will come to an end. More than ever, I said, you guys have got to stay together as a team. And when this is all over, you can't be hating each other so much that your team fractures as a result of this, because then you've got nothing. Now you're starting all over again. So remember that your team is more important than any one single loan. At the same time, no one person is above any one loan. Like, you know, no one person is so important that they can say, screw you to a borrower or whatever. But your team is more important than any one loan. Because when that loan closes, and yes, it's a lifelong customer and you want the referral and the repeat business, when that loan closes and you say thank you and they move on, maybe refer you down the road, next month, guess who's still around, hopefully? Your team. And you close a bunch of loans and those people are gone out the back of the pipeline and you stay in touch and they're your friends and they refer you and you catch up on Facebook. But next, the next month, guess who's still around? You and your team. So when you get frustrated, Remember that these relationships in your team are the most important thing right now. And that if you can come through this stuff together, if you can build relationships, you can actually come through everything right now even stronger than when you went into it. And the teams that stay together right now, that learn to cover and move for one another through these unique challenges, who take ownership of these challenges rather than casting blame about what's happening in the market in COVID-19 or the weather or whatever the case may be, easy to blame external circumstances. The teams that don't, that take extreme ownership, that cover and move for each other, that focus on relationships can and will actually come through this storm that we're in stronger than they went into it. And those teams, those, 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 their doors aren't closing they're not just gonna decline a little bit and get better. They're actually gonna thrive and come through the other side stronger than they went in. And that, my friends, is what I've got for you here today. Wow, that was awesome. Man, thank you so much for that powerful message. I know one, one question that I saw, and if anybody has another question for Andrew, drop them in if we have a couple of minutes here. Um, one, one question was, um, how are you staying in contact with your team? Right now, if you guys are all working from home, what are you doing to you know, keep things normalized for your team? Yep, um, so right now, um, right now um, routines are extremely important. Um, you need to be having um, electronic check-ins, whether it's over Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever platform you wanna use isn't super important. Don't get too focused on, make sure it works for you guys. And you need to do that regularly. Um, I would say at least every other week. Some teams are doing it weekly. Um, you, have to, you have to fine tune that based on your team and what your kind of op tempo workflow is like. But be careful that you find the right balance there. If you do it too often, we are, people are extremely busy right now and you can actually just become busy with meetings. And you feel like, oh my gosh, I did, I did four Zoom calls today and then, you know, it's two o'clock and I still haven't gotten any work started yet today. So make sure that you're, you're taking the temperature on your team there. Make sure that the meetings are often enough to be effective, but not so often that is preventing you actually from, um, from actually getting any work done. And, that, and, and, and so that those meetings actually are productive. So that people don't come to those meetings and go, oh, gonna be another hour of baloney and they start tuning you out. Make it infrequent enough that they're valuable enough. Like the more you talk, you know, you start to hear like, you know, Charlie, like, wah, 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 wah. And I don't even know if you even hear me anymore, you know, but like, um, so, so choose your words carefully. Um, and, and make sure your meetings are frequent enough so you're staying in touch, um, but infrequent enough so that people are like, okay, this is going to be good. Not just oh, freaking ad, but the second meet we do, we do one in the morning and one in the evening. Golly, if you did two meetings every day, five days a week, don't you think people would be like, hey man, like I, this is probably a lot of hot air in here. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you have to tune that. So. Yeah. Excellent advice. Awesome. Well, I think everybody else was just basically talking about how much they appreciated what you're doing. This lady said, Hey, Andrew, thanks for your service. My takeaway from you today is leadership. 
I liked how you explained leadership separates winners from losers, as well as your team is more important than any one loan. Definitely hard to do when you have the fracture in it. So yeah, yeah, definitely the team is great. So awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you for closing out the Mortgage Living Legends Summit. It's, it's awesome to have you here and really appreciate all your insight and information into leadership and, and what you're doing right now in this, in this environment. So thank you so much for being here. And Nick, thanks for what you're doing here, man. Keeping everybody together and uh, staying positive and making forward progress every single day, despite the challenges and the setbacks. These are things that you can control. So stay focused there. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks a lot. We'll see it. Bye. What's going on, everybody? It's Nick Carpenter here at the 2019 Legion of Loan Officers Fall Conclave, Miami. We're having a blast. Let me show you guys what we've got going on here. What's going on, everybody? Yeah! Yeah! We're going to drop some knowledge. Get, get uncomfortable. Like, how can I let people in a little bit more? You're going to go through this side right here. about like yeah tactics are great but at the end of the day authenticity is, is gonna win you see the progression of who I am and who I'm becoming on social media that is what social media is about you guys might struggle through it a little bit more right but that's about being comfortable with being uncomfortable and whenever you have that voice it's like nah I shouldn't post that then you post it dude that I built a team of eight players around me oh